In September of 1910, the English naturalist Richard Lydecker received word from a Piccadilly taxidermist, Mr. Roland Ward. He reported that the skin, skull, and horns of an unknown kudu-like antelope had been brought into his taxidermy shop. The animal had been shot in the Abyssinian Highlands by a Mr. Ivor Buxton earlier that year. It appeared to be a cross between a nyala and a kudu, and it was suggested that it be known as the spotted kudu. Lydecker received the donated specimen on behalf of the British Museum and gave it the Latin name Dragelophus buxtoni. He thought that it looked more like a nyala than a kudu and decided on mountain nyala for its common name. Little did he know at the time that the link between this species and safari hunting would be responsible for the preservation of Afro-Montane woodland in central Ethiopia in the 21st century. Ethiopia is a landlocked country situated in the Horn of Africa. Sensationalist Western media thrives on portraying the country as a war-torn, drought and famine-stricken nation with little hope of redemption. But there is much more to this country than this image of desolation. Home to Lucy, the oldest discovered hominid, it is a fascinating land, richly diverse in culture and natural wonders. Ethiopia has one of the fastest growing economies in the world and has the eighth largest GDP in Africa. It is the leading producer of wheat on the continent and the 16th largest producer of corn. Its coffee exports represent 1% of the world's total. Tourism accounts for around 6% of the GDP and safari hunting is an important component. Ethiopia is the only place in the world where the mountain nyala occurs and it is the major draw card for safari hunters. Jason Roussos is a native fourth generation Ethiopian and co-owner of Ethiopian Rift Valley Safaris. He is a professional hunter but also has a degree in wildlife biology. He has spent his whole life in the Ethiopian wilderness and has a deep understanding of the land and its people. Ethiopia is an incredibly biodiverse country. It's got mountains up to 15,000 feet. It's got one of the lowest points uh, below sea level. An incredible amount of biodiversity and different types of ecosystems. Ethiopia is about one and a half times the size of France and currently has a population of about 95 million people. Besides the capital city of Ethiopia, Addis Ababa, where about seven to eight million people live, the rest of Ethiopia is mostly rural communities where agriculture plays a major, major part of their livelihood. Most places in Africa where wildlife exists, they exist in arid or semi-arid, what we call marginal lands that are not really conducive to agriculture and large human settlements. In Ethiopia, on the other hand, up here in the highlands where the Mount Niala lives, this area is very arable. As human populations continue to grow, there's an ever-increasing demand to find more agricultural land. And as a result, populations and agriculture are encroaching into areas of wildlife habitat, national parks, even wildlife reserves. And this is the biggest challenge that's facing all wildlife conservation in this country. Some 400 kilometers southeast of the capital, Addis Ababa, lies the Bali Mountains National Park. This spectacularly diverse landscape contains juniper woodlands, Afro-Alpine meadows, moorlands and forests and extensive grasslands. Wildlife species found in this region include Abyssinian Bohor reedbuck, warthog, Menelik's bushbuck, the serval cat, the Ethiopian wolf and the mountain nyala. This little area is about, I think, 1.2 square kilometers. A little fenced area around the headquarters of Bali Mountains National Park. It's like a little sanctuary for Mount Niala. There's just a tremendous density of them here. You can walk in through the hills here and get real close to them. It's a wonderful place for photo tourists to come and take pictures and just really enjoy being with Mount Niala. This kind of saturates the demand for photo tourists to come and see Nialas. With a place like this, why venture out into the rugged highlands and struggle through rough roads and, and, and difficult conditions to see a Mount Niala when you have a beautiful sanctuary like this where you can just walk up to them and take pictures of them. So as a result, not many tourists would ever even want to venture out of this place to see Mount Niala. It's a tremendous resource, this. 
But the areas outside of these protected areas like the park also need conservation. They're vital to the long-term survival of the mountain Niala. And it's hunters that are the ones who are willing to venture into these places in search for Mount Niala. And they're the ones that create the benefits that are much needed for the conservation efforts in those areas. Forests in Ethiopia may have at one time covered as much as 35% of the country, but this has since been reduced to around 2.3%. 58 forest priority areas covering 2.3 million hectares have been designated to conserve the forests of the country. Despite this official protection, a multitude of intertwining factors are contributing to deforestation of some 163,000 hectares annually. In 1982, Adaba Dodola Forestry Priority Area stretched over 140,000 hectares. But today, this Afro-Montane forest is only 53,000 hectares in extent. Rapid deforestation and environmental degradation has forced the Forest Administration to seek an alternative to a government command-controlled conservation approach. In Ethiopia, all land belongs to the state, but participatory forest management has been established in the forestry priority areas. The objective is to achieve sustainable forest management through community empowerment. Janini Haile is a district forest manager for the region. ولكن <laughs> There are five outfitters in Ethiopia that currently hunt Mount Niala. Um, we're responsible for protecting roughly about 2,000 square kilometers of Mount Niala habitat. I have been uh, uh, in this sector, in the hunting industry, for the, the last 30 years. The most important species in Ethiopia is Mount Niala just because of it is endemic and the only place you found is uh, only in Ethiopia. Even in Ethiopia you found in uh, a very limited place like uh, Bale Mountain and Arsi Mountain and Harar Mountain. It's, you cannot find it anywhere else in the world. My concession is in, in uh, Bale, western part, part of the national park. The concession called Adaba Dodola Control Hunting Area. This concession owned by the community. Bazi area ost gawi aden ka huletishi anda matamarod jamro no mekado na aden onenya gawi aden kamata gize jamro ye PFM approach kamata gize jamro higgaot aden ellem abalatu urasu den onenya don sato no me from this uh, license, hunting license fee, they get 60%, and from concession fee, they get 60% direct benefit. In Ethiopia, there is a method, uh, they make a census every two years. The, the census does by the uh, EUCA, which is Ethiopian Wildlife Conservation Authority and region. We see the, the, the improvement. Every two years when we go for census, we get a better quota, a better quality of trophy, just because of the legal hunting. People, they become like, they just look now like their own cattle.
in the state of poaching because of they get benefit, you know, they want to keep for a legal hunting, things like that. When I started nine years ago in this area, the quota was one. After three years, I get two. For about four years, uh, I stay with two quota. Now I have three quota a year. The hunting success is 100%, 100% and the quality of the trophy is the best. I hope, I hope I will get more quota next season. Our company currently has five controlled hunting areas. Um, within each of those controlled hunting areas, we employ between 15 and 20 people on an annual salary basis to manage the area as well as to prevent illegal activities even when we're not hunting. This area that we're in now, the Odobulu Basmana controlled hunting area, we only hunt here three to four months out of the year because of the very difficult weather conditions. In this forest, we harvest five mountain yala a year, about four bushbuck, and some other wildlife species such as giant forest hog. Those five mountain yala that we harvest a year enable us to protect this forest and to actually grow the resource. We maintain 17 people employed here year round, of which 15 of them are game scouts that go out and patrol the forest, make sure people are only cutting dry wood, make sure they're only cutting wood on the days they're supposed to, and making sure that there's no poaching going on. So it's very important to keep a presence in the area, not only when you're there hunting, but throughout the whole year. So as a result of that, we're actually saving hundreds, if not thousands of animals. I mean, we're saving everything from the mountain yala all the way down to the little chameleons that live in the trees, because if the hunting were stopped here, this entire forest that you see would be wiped out in a matter of years. The forestry authorities have realized that for the conservation efforts to work, the communities must be allowed controlled access to forest resources. When the villagers are coming to the forest to cut wood twice a week, these are the type of trees that they're allowed to cut up for fuel wood. You can see this is a tree that just naturally fell down, so they can cut trees like this. They're not allowed to cut green trees, but any trees that have naturally fallen down or dry trees, they're allowed to cut for fuel wood, um, as well as some building materials. Um, but mostly it's to heat their homes and also to cook with. So every Thursday and every Saturday, they're allowed to come in and collect dry wood, as well as collect bamboo for construction materials. The cutting of uh, fuel wood like this, dry wood, is actually in no way really detrimental to the forest. In fact, the thinning of the forest is actually good for it. It makes really good bushbuck habitat. The real threat to the forest is the slash and burn, where they come in, they cut down the trees, and they burn the trees on the spot in order to make way for agriculture. One of the other things that we allow the villagers to benefit from the forest is uh, honey gathering. Um, they make these beehives like this out of trunk, they carve it out, they wrap bamboo around it, and they take it right up to the top of the trees, they make a plug. This guy here, we caught him, he's been, he obviously cut down this really big tree, probably, I'd probably guess about three or four months ago, maybe even six months ago, kind of let it dry out a bit, and he came back again, and now he's chopping up this wood into beehives. So he's carving out these two pieces of trunk and then he's going to put them together and use them for beehives. You know, there's an amount of what we can tolerate, what we allow them to do, but obviously when they're cutting down green trees like this guy did, we don't allow them to do that. Gathering honey is something that they've been doing for hundreds of years here. So there's no way we're going to stop them doing it. Uh, we just like it to be done in a managed way that's got a minimal impact on the habitat and the area. The biggest threat used to be poaching some 10, 11 or 15 years back. Now almost nothing, no poaching at all. But the most threat is for the mountain Niala is settlement. Settlement, the people they take their own cattle for grazing. Some people also they go there for plowing. That's the threat for the mountain Niala. But zero percent of poaching just because of the legal hunting. So what happens to a forestry area once hunting safari operators move out and people move in? The Golama Mountains form part of the Asi Range and are situated in the Oromia region of the country. From the 1960s through the 1980s, this was considered one of the best hunting areas in Ethiopia. In 1993, hunting was closed for two years whilst the whole system was being restructured. 
during that time, the mountains really got hammered. Um, there was no one up here controlling the mountains and there was a lot of poaching and agricultural encroachment and, and burning going on. Where we are now is actually uh, right at the heather zone, we call it, which is basically tree line. So the agriculture really can't come any higher than this because the barley just won't grow higher than this. But what's happened is we're in this Erica heather zone and the heather in this area at these lower altitudes should be much taller. You see how tall the heather should be. I mean, this is just some, some that some was recently burned, but not badly burned, but this heather should be this tall, but as you can see, the rest of it has just been burned to the ground. And the reason they do that is to clear it so that grass grows to uh, promote palatable uh, forage for the cattle. And then they bring the cattle up here and they graze the cattle inside these little grassy areas. But if all of the heather was this tall, like, like this bush would have been, there would be no graze up here for the cattle. So that's why they burn the area. We're probably at about 12 and a half thousand feet here. So about three and a half thousand meters. So pretty much every night it freezes. Uh, conditions are very difficult up here, very cold, windy. And what happens when the heather gets burned is the Nialas lose what cover they they vitally need to survive up at these elevations. They lose thermal cover, they lose uh, um, just, you know, hiding cover, um, all, any form of cover is just devoid when the area gets burned like this. As a result, the infants, you know, the young Nialas don't survive. Even the older ones struggle in such extreme conditions are found up here at these elevations. In the background here, you can kind of see just a tiny little patch of the natural forest that's left. This is the only patch we've seen the whole day today in the Galama Mountain. And this entire area below this heather should look like that but as you can see huts are springing up agriculture i mean this little patch of forest i mean it's what little bit that's left and pretty soon it'll be gone as well said a long time ago there was just one old man that used to live up here now many more people have moved up and this guy actually was born in this area but lower down and he said just as everybody moves up we all moved up too just to find more land to, to farm like this so he only remembers wildlife when he was a kid, he said. This wood is actually heather. So you can see just how big at these lower elevations the heather gets. I mean, this is, I mean, they're just like a, like a small tree. So this is all the remnants of what used to be here. Yeah, now it's all agriculture. So in 1995, uh, my company, Ethiopian Rift Valley Safaris, we came up here and we started to put some management back into the area and we tried to get the heather back, control some of the agricultural encroachment. And we did relatively well, however, this area is so vast and it's represented by six different counties or kabales as they're called here in Ethiopia. And, and as a result, we were dealing with tens of thousands, if not closer to 100,000 local communities who had an interest in the Galama Mountains. Frankly, one little hunting company and, and a small conservation fund, we just could not manage such a vast area. And as a result, we sadly had to leave this area in 1999. And since then, it's, it's unfortunately really gone from worse to worse. Um, there's a little pocket in the southern range that's been protected through a national forest, but I'd say probably at least 90% of the Galama Mountains are completely devoid now of Mount Niala and almost all wildlife. It's just another example of how when the hunting was here, we were, you know, something was being done. But when we left, the agriculture took over and the grazing took over and uh, the wildlife really suffered. Jason Roussos, with his degree in wildlife biology, understands the importance of science in supporting sustainable trophy hunting. Around 2000, um, some friends of mine who were also um, at university and in the same uh, program as me uh, set up the Marule Foundation. The Marule Foundation is a US-based 501c3 nonprofit. And the idea of this foundation was that we would do conservation work as well as wildlife research in Ethiopia. I'm Dr. Paul Evangelista. I'm a research ecologist here at the Natural Resource Ecology Lab at Colorado State University and uh, first started working on the Mount Niala in uh, 2000 and 2001. We conducted, uh, I think, a three-month uh, survey of all wildlife in the Galama Mountains. At the end of our assessment, what we all found disappointing and both disturbing was that 
the number of Mount Niala that were left in the Galama Mountains were quite low. Um, I think our estimates back then put the population, the regional population there at about 75 to 100 animals maximum. The fact that there were so little Mount Niala left and so much habitat degradation that had occurred that I didn't feel that this was even a viable population anymore. Uh, following that assessment, uh, in 2001, we had uh, started receiving reports that there were Mount Niala populations in the eastern part of the Bali Mountains. This is an area that had never previously had documentation of Mount Niala. And so we were able to get in there early on with the help of Ethiopian Rift Valley safaris to start uh, assessments as, as early as 2002. Um, what we found was that there were not only Mount Niala populations there, but there were actually large numbers. And, and, and more importantly, the habitat that was in this area was quite intact and uh, quite different than anything we had ever seen. There was still very little human pressure. Uh, Mount Niala as well as other wildlife species seemed to be pretty abundant. And uh, uh, we, started, uh, we started our work there in what's now considered the Otobulu Controlled Hunting Concession. In 2004, a scientific paper on the status of the Mount Niala in Ethiopia was published in the African Journal of Ecology. The conclusion of this study was that the total population of Mount Inyala throughout the country was estimated to be less than 1,000, and that the study area encompassed 95% of the total Mount Inyala population. The area that was being referred to in that study actually encompasses about halfway up this other mountain, across this valley, there's a little hill on the other side around the park headquarters, and then up this hill here. This area is about 12, roughly 12 square kilometers. And according to that paper, it supposedly harbors 95% of the Mount Niala that exists in Ethiopia. Um, so about 950, according to their estimates, live in this area. At the time, there was over seven hunting concessions in Ethiopia, all of which were producing top quality Mount Niala trophies. So it's absurd to think that 50 Mount Niala, male, females, and juveniles, was all that lived outside of Bali Mountains National Park. Now this paper was taken by the IUCN and was widely being accepted in the scientific community as the actual accurate estimate of Mount Niala populations. What's interesting about the paper that Jason mentioned, uh, when it was published in 2004, we had already spent three years studying Mount Niala in the eastern parts of the Bali Mountains. And by that time, we were quite confident that the population just in that new region, in the Odobulu and what's now considered Damaro, uh, we, the evidence suggested that there were well over a thousand Mount Niala just in this one area that had never been reported. I'm Nick Young. I'm a research associate here at the Natural Resource Ecology Lab at Colorado State University. I was brought on to this Mount Niala project about five years ago in 2009. And having a background in wildlife biology and an interest in spatial modeling, I was really excited about this project. One of the things we're trying to achieve um, with this kind of spatial modeling and this project we have going on is a way to monitor the Mount Niala habitat over time. And we've been building upon the observations that were taken in the field by Dr. Paul Evangelista and Jason to really use that data to extract more information. Unfortunately, with today's technology, we have a whole bunch of tools that we can use to try and answer some of these hard questions, especially for a species that lives in a very remote and rugged habitat. We have satellite imagery that's taking pictures of the Earth every 16 days, so it allows us to have a continuous monitoring of the Earth's surface. And if we use that with information that we've collected on the ground in the field, and with these advanced statistical algorithms, we can start to answer some of these questions that weren't really possible 10 years ago to shed new light on, a, on questions that are really challenging to answer. So what we've been doing is we've been using the satellite imagery record from Landsat satellites to kind of look at the past forest cover of these areas and see how they change over time. And specifically, we wanted to look at what these different protected areas look like and how they may differ. So what we did is we took imagery 
going way back all the way to the 1980s and kind of compared that to imagery that was taken in the 2000s. What we're looking at here is the results of our models. And you can see here in the dark green is where we've detected forests and it hasn't changed over the time span. You can see here in the red is where we've detected forests in a previous time, but at the most recent time period it's been gone. So this is forest loss over that time span. Finally, we have this light green, and that's showing where there wasn't forest in our first time period, but in the most recent time period, forest has grown in, that, in those areas. So this is reforestation in this area. And if you look closely, we can see these different protected areas. We have Munessa, which is a state-run forestry enterprise. We have the Bali Mountains, which is a national park. And then we have these two hunting concessions owned by ERVS. And if we compare these, we can kind of see some noticeable differences. First, we have Munessa, which is a forestry enterprise. So their main goal is developing a system where they can extract timber products. And so they want to protect the resources that they have. So they do patrol this area to make sure that there's no illegal harvesting. But they do harvest the timber in this area. But you can see, if we zoom into this area, that there's these very clear areas where they have clear-cutted some areas, but they also have areas where they, you can see where they came in and planted immediately after these clear cuts. So they regrew that forest in that area. If we take a look at Bali Mountains National Park, which has the highest protection status of the Mountain Niala, we can start and see, first of all, that it's a much larger area. So it's a much harder area to completely monitor. On top of that, we can see that in this big forest, this is the Horena Forest, that we're seeing a lot of forest loss where these local communities are coming in and slowly harvesting, setting up agriculture, and grazing in these areas. And you can see this depicted in the red in this map. You can also see right here in the middle of Bali Mountains National Park where there's a village, Rira, and that has been a controversial village in the park because it's a settlement in the park that actually has a lot of people in it. And the park has been really working hard to try and figure out how to um, address this issue. But you can see as the longer that village exists in the park, it slowly has impacts in the surrounding forests. So this is a big concern for wildlife conservation. Finally, when we look over at the two hunting concessions, you can see that we do have some red, but what we found compared to these other two protected areas that the, that the hunting concessions actually showed more forest regeneration than any of the other two parks. And mind you, this, this span covered from 1987 to 2010, and these, park, these hunting concessions were not established until the early 2000s. So although they haven't had protection status throughout this whole time, we can really see the benefit that that management is having on these specific areas. And along those lines, what this can be really powerful for is looking at how well different stakeholders are doing at protecting mountain yellow habitat. So I know ERVS works with a lot of local communities in trying to communicate to them how important the Mountain Yala is and try and encourage them to protect the habitat. What we can do with this satellite is see, okay, well we deliver that message, how well are people actually putting that into practice? Are they going out there and trying to prevent harvesting of the Mountain Yala's forest? So we can see where some communities are doing well and where others are maybe falling behind. And what Jason can do is bring this back to communities and say, hey, based on satellite imagery, you know, you guys aren't doing as well of a job to protect Mountain Yala habitat. It'd be great if we could work together to try and remedy that. And this is something that we have been trying to introduce um, is a way of what we're talking about weighted benefits. Um, what this means is if several communities represent uh, a, a hunting concession, for example, that the communities do not benefit equally. If they benefit equally, it doesn't really lead to incentive for each community to work more towards conservation of their particular areas. What the weighted system actually does is it rewards the communities that have actually done more for conservation of mountain yellow habitat than the ones who don't. Now, by dividend, the Malcono or the Nasu or Yimikavalo by Yamatu or Odita Dargo, but I know how by Zone Odita. And now, Hin and Guns of Siaganu demo, Rasachum Gansabunus do the Rasacho account as Gabuto, Yimakaralu, in Yon Gansa Men in this rabbit. Tumurtuitum Cabacalacho to Murtuit, a clinic, and Dum demo, Rasachonis of Sabadarasina, 
ቢሮም እየሰሩበት አሉ የራሳቸው ኖሮ ለማቀያር ከሳር ቤት ወደ ቆርቆሮ ቤት ይቀየሩበት አሉ we can bring this map to stakeholders at the national level and tell them you know it's not all on the national parks to help protect the mountain yala we can show them that these other protected areas that although they have different management strategies they all have the same goal they want to protect this species and we can highlight the benefits that that each one of these management areas can have we understand that there might need to be areas that have complete preservation but we also need to complement that with areas that do a more sustainable use as long as we continue to see more light green than we do red there's a promising future for the mountain yala the results of that original paper that was published in 2004 that stated there was less than 1000 mountain yala existing in ethiopia would have had devastating impacts on mountain yala conservation in ethiopia and the reason for this is that internationally policymakers such as CITES and the IUCN and even Fish and Wildlife would have looked at those results and concluded that mountain yala populations were critically endangered and they would have immediately banned all trade in mountain yala. This would have spelled an end to sport hunting and conservation through utilization. What we were able to do is to create a project that countered that. And we countered it through scientifically sound methodologies and uh, and techniques that were superior to what the original researchers um, used to come up with their conclusions and as a result of this there is absolutely no doubt that it is because of this work that there's still mountain yala hunting today but more importantly the benefits and the conservation as a result of those protected areas where mountain yala hunting happens is at the state that it is today if the legal hunting stopped, first of all, the people, they start again poaching. Second, they will take all the area for agriculture and grazing land so that you don't even see a single tree in the area. The future of the Afro-Montane forests of Ethiopia is inextricably linked to the fate of the mountain Yala. And without safari hunting, that species' prospects look grim. For wildlife conservation to work in Africa, a balanced approach is needed, which takes into account both economic factors and the socio-cultural needs of the indigenous people. The mantra of the anti-hunting lobby is that hunters are not conservationists. Their claim is that hunters are only interested in satisfying a bloodlust and have little concern for wildlife or the environment. The truth of the matter is that those who utilize a natural resource are most likely to want to conserve it.